Welcome everyone, and again, my apologies for uh, for this delay here. You know, SubhanAllah, um, Dr. Imad, he joins us. Does anyone know where he's joining us from? From Halifax, right? And if anyone's flown from Halifax, you know that it's closer to fly to Europe than it is to fly from Halifax over here to Vancouver. So it's a long trek that he's made, uh, and he's come last night. Um, and, you know, SubhanAllah, I was mentioning before that he came down with a bit of a flu. Um, and even coming out to today's uh, afternoon uh, Friday sermon that we had was a bit of a challenge for him. Uh, so he did have to go and re recover and uh, rejuvenate. And then uh, he's just uh, 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 present now, alhamdulillah. Uh, so again, my apologies for the delay here. Um, but I also thank you for, for understanding. And I hope, I hope that you don't hold it against me or the organizers because you got your refreshment. And technically, technically, there's no food or drink in this lecture hall. So if you think I'm guilty, then all of you guys are just guilty. <laughs> Alright, so again, welcome. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa wa rasulillah. I begin uh, with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and inshallah, we're going to begin today's program uh, with a bit of a Quran recitation. So I'd like to invite Brother Imam to join us in the front as he delivers a recit uh, recitation of the whole Quran. Thank you. 
In addition to his participation in lectures, seminars, and interfaith dialogues in North America, Dr. Jamal Badawi has been invited as a guest speaker in various events throughout the world. I know he's cringing, he doesn't want to hear all these credentials that I'm saying about him. He is also an active, he's also active in several Islamic organizations and the founder and chairman of the Islamic Information Foundation, a non-profit foundation seeking to promote a better understanding of Islam and Muslims, toward, uh, and Muslims towards non-Muslims. Um, and he has lectured extensively in North America and abroad. He speaks on a variety of topics, including Islam and Christianity, the essence of Sharia, the preservation of Quran. He's been a guest scholar at uh, the American Learning Institute for Muslims, and we're thrilled and we're privileged to have him join us today. Uh, SubhanAllah, I remember we were fortunate to have him, I believe, back in 2008, 2009, uh, when SubhanAllah, we were all a whole lot younger. And we were able to have a head theater for an Islam awareness or for an Islam awareness week, and mashallah, it was uh, it was such a beautiful gathering. So we're uh, we're thankful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that we can have another similar opportunity. So without further ado, I'd like you all to welcome uh, Dr. Jamal Badawi. All praise is due to Allah, the sole Creator, Sustainer, and Cherisher of the universe. And may his peace and blessing be upon his last prophet, Prophet Muhammad, and all his fellow prophets before him. I greet you with the traditional greeting, uh, not only greeting of Islam, in fact, those who are familiar with the Bible and the Quran know, know that this is the basic universal greeting of all of the prophets, in fact, the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means may the peace, blessing, and mercy of Allah, God, capital G, be with you all. I would have to first apologize for the late arrival. Uh, we were driving from, uh, I wasn't driving, I was driven from Surrey. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but, but the speaker should be there first. <laughs> I tried my best, but it was at all the, in, in my hand. So my apology for that, but I'm going to reward you for that. <laughs> I'll be reasonably brief, and inshallah we can spend the rest of, of time available in interactive question answer period. When we speak about the uh, title, uh, it's Islam with, or world without Islam. We can approach it from two perspectives. One, typical one, and I had a topic on that already as one of the options of the presentation, is to look at the past, as most people would do, and see what contributions were made or inspired by Islam a quick contribution that started uh, very early on in the uh, maybe the mid 8th century, very early period of the beginning of Islam and the emergence of the Prophet of Islam, and trace that through glorious periods of many, many <coughs> centuries. Uh, George Sarton, in his book History of Science, I think it was published by Harvard University. Multi-volume, extensive work. I was preparing a topic on Muslim contribution to civilization from the standpoint of science, humanity, sociology, and all other areas. And impressed, he impressed me, in fact, with the extensive, detailed knowledge that he culled in his mainly encyclopedic work about history of science. And I tried to review the period that he refers to, uh, which involved contribution by the Islamic community, uh, all the way not only from 750, but to the 1254 or thereabout, uh, after the, uh, the fall of Baghdad, but even continued for many centuries in Muslim Spain, uh, in variety of fields of knowledge, which is very impressive that many of the inventions that uh, we consider to be relatively recent are inventions that were key 
attributed to some other Western scientists uh, that indeed was preceded many centuries before by contributions of Muslims. And um, of course, there are books written on that subject and how even in the mind of some fair-minded Western historians, they say that without the Muslim contribution for this whole period of, of many centuries, uh, the world or the Renaissance itself would have not taken place or would have been delayed by many centuries. Other writers protested the fact that this huge amount of contributions in a variety of knowledge, areas of knowledge uh, are sometimes contrived to be hidden, out of, kept out of sight, or somewhat uh, reduced in importance. I remember one time uh, I was invited to give a special course in, uh, in uh, California, and uh, the course was like a creative type of idea, a course that's not included in the areas uh, that's covered already in official courses and departments, but you have to be sponsored by a department. The sponsor of that course, which was about the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was from the Department of History. He invited me for lunch before he launched that course. And he said that oftentimes, the way Western <laughs> writers, historians, especially on science, they, they speak about the contributions of the Greeks and Romans, and then somehow, as if time free froze for many, many, many centuries, and all of a sudden, they talk about the Renaissance. That was a very revealing argument that he was making. He's not a, he's just a scholar in, of history, no connection with Islam in terms of belief or anything. Uh, that is basically what some writers say, that the huge contribution was some, somehow kept out of sight because, of course, the religious conflicts and rancor. And also, let's be frank, a sort of Eurocentric type of uh, focus that civilization, you know, Greek civilization, Roman civilization, this, this and that, and then the sons. So eliminating this uh, huge period of contribution. So some of these scholars actually were uh, protesting that. Uh, however, this is one way of uh, looking at uh, one more example of Eurocentric thinking. You heard of the term Dark Ages, right? Well, Dark Ages for whom? Yes, for Europe. Actually, it should be specified more precisely, European Dark Ages. That's fine. But it wasn't dark, it was so luminous in universities, research centers, especially in Baghdad, in Muslim Spain, where scientists and scholars from all varieties of background, Jewish, Muslim, atheist, humanist, subhanAllah, about the tolerance and plurality that exhibited in this kind of period. And the, the great caliphs, we're not saying all of them were good, but generally speaking, were the great patrons of science. Uh, so that whole period was very a luminous period. But however, what occurred to my mind, uh, even today, is to shift focus a little bit. We can speak about glories of the past and so on, but not in the sense of uh, uh, focus on pride. Because science, after all our contributions, is a cumulative uh, enterprise, and definitely the great contribution of Muslims, immense as they may be, was in part at least uh, a, yeah, a result of the uh, 
previous research done by many other scholars all over the world. Likewise, uh, the uh, Renaissance was inspired, no question, many people admit that today, was inspired by the contribution made by, or inspired by Islam. And even the, uh, the amazing development of science benefited also from this. In other words, we shouldn't take it in terms of partisanship by religion or one particular. So it is in that sense that I felt uh, more obligated really to address it from the future, the present and future. Yes, those who are interested in history, yes, I have a whole paper on that. In fact, if you email, email me, I can send you my research paper on that explicit contribution. But in the kind of glo globalization that we are facing today as, as a theme or paradigm, we have also a parallel one of plurality. Many societies today are no longer the exclusive uh, group of people by, uh, by virtue of uh, race or ethnicity or geographical area. I think we all realize that. I know Canada, of course, is one of the prime examples of embracing uh, plurality and diversity. Uh, in fact, you can have diversity within unity or unity in diversity. Um, so what I uh, thought in terms of if the world really did not have this element, then you can think what would have happened, but future-wise, is that what we need? I have been participating, as the brother chair was saying, for ever since I arrived in the United States in 1963, I know I'm beginning lots of things, 1963 as a graduate student. Uh, I have been involved with intra-dialogue between Muslims also various uh, school of jurisprudence. Uh, Muslim-Christian dialogues took a great deal of my interest for a long period of time uh, because at that time a lot of Americans were not really that familiar with Islam and most of them, especially at Indiana University, the Bloomington, Bloomington campus, you have a whole variety of students from uh, if, you know, international uh, students. Um, so that was part of the interest. There were instances, uh, past and re more recent, uh, where I got interested also in trialogues, several trialogues, but was limited to the Abrahamic religions, Jewish, Muslim, Christian. Something that was very rare that I was wondering why we didn't have more of that. It is true, of course, that the Abrahamic religions, as they're called, because of many similarities and uh, lineage, physical and or spiritual, to Abraham, uh, it made sense, yes. But the world is not only Muslim, Jews, and Christians. There is a huge fellow humans also who do not belong to these three religions. Of course, notably, if you take the various uh, branches of Buddhism, Hinduism, and similar religions like Jainism. Uh, and then I wonder why we didn't have more contact also and dialogue on that broader level. There was only very rare exception where, for example, uh, both in Dalhousie University in Halifax, and one time I remember also in the States, we had a very interesting and challenging uh, dialogue on environment. See, you don't dispute about the importance of environment, so that was a, a gathering thing. There's no big difference between Jew, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, even atheist. There's a given cause. I'm always, I've been always interested in finding the common ground, not only between religions, but uh, traditional religions, but all religions 
But that wasn't enough even in my mind. Recently, uh, I was humbly presenting a paper in an international uh, interfaith that I wrote in Doha, Qatar, which what hold it annually. That I tried to present humbly a sort of new paradigm whereby the particularities of every religion should be respected. And I made it clear that I'm not calling uh, for what is called syncretism. That you say, well, all religions have the same thing and same goodness and this and that. So it, it is like melting any difference between one religion and the other for the sake of peace to have just one civil religion. Uh, this is not a very serious thing. You, com you don't have to compromise your identity as a Muslim, Jew, or Christian, or Buddhist, or whatever. You don't have to compromise that uh, to come ha meet halfway. And theologically, it doesn't make uh, sense. Uh, for example, if a Christian believes that Jesus is God incarnate, and a Muslim insists, according to the Quran, that he considered the word of God, that Jesus was a great prophet, a human being, but one of the greatest human beings. How do you come in, in between? How do you compromise? You see, it's just like, you know, the story of David, when uh, two women were disputing whether their baby is theirs, and he came up with a brilliant idea to find the truth. Everyone said, this is my son. Oh, don't, this is my child. He said, no problem. We'll get a big knife and cut the baby, compromise, cut the baby into half, and each one take a half. The real mother said, no, 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 please, let her take the nap. This was the real mother. So that's a, a dysfunctional type of compromise. But like one guru in management said it for time, Peter Draga, half a loaf of bread is a reasonable compromise. We're both hungry, take half and half, okay. So not all compromises. So this is the kind of fallacy in terms of putting all religions you know, in one pot, just uh, make it like a soup or a big chef and salad or <laughs> everything. But even the salad is better because in the salad the tomatoes remain tomatoes, they could come back remains. But they're all together. Not that make a little bit more so mix it all together, you know, in one fluid. It doesn't make that much. Uh, so this is one point uh, I tried to to me. But then I said we need, even when we speak about the need for peace and environmental protection and reduction of the injustices in the world, we can't only talk about faith community unless we define faith in a very broad way. There are people who are humanists and people who are atheists. Okay, you don't have to agree with them. But is it possible that there are some activities that would benefit all that provide a common ground? There is a basis for that actually in the biography of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. One of the things that he praised even after prophethood, you know, he received the first revelation as a prophet at the age of 40. But long before that, there was an incident that happened in Mecca. Mecca was a very central you know, commercial uh, route for people trading from Syria and Yemen and all of that. It was a very important uh, center at the time. <coughs> and one time a merchant came from, from outside of Mecca. He was not an Arab, he was you know, just a stranger. And one of the chieftains of Quraysh, one of the, the tribe of the Prophet, the most powerful tribe here, bought certain things from him and he did not pay him back. So that man went public in front of everyone and he started invoking some of the things that were good also among those idolatrous Arabs, but there's something good in there. He said, how come, uh, you're like a stranger coming here to you, uh, and he doesn't get his right. So many people felt sorry for him. 
So the chiefs decided to hold a meeting in one of their houses. And in that meeting, guess who was present? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was not a prophet at that time, at least not called uh, to, to mission. So they discussed the matter. And they said, this is not right, this is not fair, this is not good, even Arab character, even if you are built to ethnicity, even. this is not good. Let's make an agreement that if anyone is wronged, like this, like this sir, whether he's from Mecca or outside, whether he's an Arab or non-Arab, we should all unite together, go to that person who you know, wronged the, the other, and force him or get him to give the right. And they did actually in that instance, and the person was shamed to pay back what is due to that outsider. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and that's the essence of the evidence that there is no prohibition in Islam of cooperating with other people in areas that does not contradict your faith, regardless of their religious belief or non-religious belief even for that. But even after he received the revelation, maybe there was a good reason for him to say, oh, you know that uh, agreement is inferior because the Quran gives so many beautiful and powerful things about <coughs> justice and doing justice. We'll talk about this in a little while. But he says actually that that kind of agreement is very beloved to my heart. And even today, meaning after I received the Quran with all these values in it, even if it's invoked today, I will respond. And one more evidence for those who might wonder, do you have evidence from the Quran? Yes, even in the Quran itself, in the fifth chapter, it says, Cooperate with one another in everything that is decent and righteous, and do not cooperate with one another in things that are indecent and unjust. The ayah here did not say cooperate addressing Muslims. There is no evidence that it addresses only Muslims. This notion of universality in, with respect to particularity of each religion appeared to me so much that I'm going to share humbly a few thoughts with you. The whole presentation there was predicated on a claim and it's a claim only of a person. Yes, I did teach courses also in religious studies at St. Mary's for several years. Many years, actually. I don't know how they asked me to do that, uh, even though my home department is, is management. Uh, my submission is that we can take a notion that nobody, hopefully, with good sense, I should say, of most people, great majority, the notion of human dignity. Does it matter what you believe in or not believe in? And the way it is mentioned in the Quran is not the dignity of a believer or a Muslim alone. Okay? Look at Surah Al Isra, chapter 17 in the Quran. In the Quran. And I said also in Arabic. In the Quran, by the way, it's titled God Speaks or direct the prophet. It's not like the prophet wrote it. It is sometimes direct word of God. In the first person. But it is the word of God, all of it, in variety of ways of expression. It says, Allah, God, says, Indeed, we, means God, have ennobled or dignified who? The children of Adam. Let's read it right. The Quran for the days we dignify only Muslims, only believers in God. It says, we endowed or conferred dignity on the children of Adam. Children of Adam 
is not only one religion or the other, it embraces everyone. It doesn't mean that it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or reject, but that's theological position by variety of religions. The same thing was repeated elsewhere again, speaking about dignity, always using the broader term that applies to everyone. So what I'm going to do in the remaining, inshallah, not too long, few minutes, is to, having articulated where dignity is mentioned in the Quran, that in this is all, that I consider that personally as the anchor, the anchor of all other uh, universal principles that are inherently Islamic but also potentially uh, universal for all. Some of the signs and examples of that dignity in the Quran is not just a nice motherhood statement. Have lots of uh, 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 manifestations in the Quran. One is that this dignity of the human preceded the creation of the first human. Sounds strange, isn't it? The dignity of the human was established before even the first human, Adam and Eve, or two humans, were created. We find that, for example, in chapter 2 and also chapter 38 in the Quran, uh, when Allah declares to the angels, and He says, I am going to create a human. In another ayat it says, a human created of clay. It doesn't mean, it could mean clay, literally, no problem. It could mean the same elements that are found on, on earth, which is scientifically also viable. Anyway, but then he tells them, commands them, when I create that human, when I created that human and breathed into him or her, it, anyway, because it is not there, of my spirit, my ruh, then bow down to him. Bow down to him. Here, the human hasn't been created, but Allah is prepared the angel to show that dignity to him. But then some might say, angels, the symbol of purity, bowing down to sinful human beings. I'll tell you why. Possibly, when, a, when an angel obeys God, when an angel is good, it is not a big deal, because they can't be bad. As the Quran describes, angels are creatures that the Quran says, they never disobey Allah, they always do as Allah commands them. So it's not a big deal. How about the human? The human is not naturally devilish or angelic. You can tell it's a little bit each. Some might have 99.9% of this or that, but it's a combination of both. So when a human being was created by Allah, to have the love for material, love for life, love for pleasures, and all of this, has so many attractions, follows the command of God. Yes, you can enjoy that, but avoid this, avoid this, avoid that. These are the boundaries or limits. To resist temptation is not easy. I think everybody here, almost, <laughs> unless we have an angel <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> it, it, it is hard. Temptation of prayers in some situations, some age period, you know, period our human development and so on. It's very hard. Uh, money, money is available, something we can steal, nobody will watch it and so on. To resist temptations, you have to exert that effort. And as such, a human, no matter how imperfect, who's trying their best to do the right thing, avoid the wrong, it's a big deal. And we all know it's a big deal, it takes effort, determination, and self-control. And that's, we could be even conceptually higher than the position of the angel. That is one example. Secondly, when several ayat in the Quran, I give you chapter number to check it, it's chapter 95, 82, and 90, all, among others, 
showing another form how Allah dignified the human. Say it even physically, the symmetry that you find in the creation. Look at very interesting ayah. <laughs> human and make for him or endow him with two eyes, one tongue, and two lips. Why one tongue? We have lots of problems with one tongue. If they will pierce, got this one. Anyway, uh, then some ayat are very dire. وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْرِيمٍ لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْرِيمٍ Indeed, we created the human and the best of modes. Of course, we are aware of some abnormalities, but generally speaking, Allah created the human in the best, and that's endowment also in physical uh, dignity of the human. The Quran also speaks about the human being as a combination of like three related elements, one of them seems to be forgotten by many human beings. You'll find that in Surah Sajda, the 32nd Surah of the Quran, in the early parts of it, describing the human. Allah created everything good and began the creation of the human from clay. Like I said again, most people said clay in the physical sense that Allah took part of the earth and breathe. It's not too much for Allah to do. There are other also who say the word min, it means not necessarily from, but actually of the elements of clay, which like I said earlier, scientifically speaking, a human being is composed from the same element that you find in earth, carbon, phosphorus, mineral, all of those things, potassium, sodium, uh, and of course, a huge amount of water. Um, whatever is it, it is interpreted, uh, it, meant it, it, it refers to the physical part of the human. The human is an integrated whole. Uh, the Quran does teach that uh, forms of religion. So that's one. But, uh, and then it refers to something, like I said, that seems to be forgotten or ignored even though it is the most important thing that makes a human really a human. And that is, as that verse says, and other verses similar to it, نَفَخَ Allah breathed into that human something of his spirit. Not incarnation, any? No. That's a symbol of the spiritual nature, the yearning of the human heart, before they indoctrinated one way or the other, the natural, innate nature of the human to try to search that power beyond or more in the, the monotheistic religion's terminology, God or the Creator. So th this uh, divine breath, if you will, is perhaps the most important indication of the dignity of the human. Then you move on and you find um, a variety of other manifestations. I hope I just made enough case here yeah, for how this dignity, uh, one element of that dignity, for example, that is mentioned in the Quran in chapter 2, verse 30 on 30, uh, that God was telling the angel, I'm going to create a trustee on earth. Some translated vicegerent, a trustee on earth. It's not trustee in the sense that Allah needs someone to help him run this vast universe. So you assign a job to your trustee to do it for you. Like you want to buy a home and you know, give, the, give your lawyer the instruction. To do. No, he doesn't. What it is then? Why does, does Allah want a trustee on this earth? Some people will say, ah, the Quran says that Allah created you on this earth, so that you fill it from Himara, development. But what does Allah want that development for? He doesn't need it. Okay? So some people may give a slightly better answer. Uh, Khalifa, because Allah wanted the human 
uh, to act in accordance with the will of God. Not the trustee because he needs us, but because he honors us. Where the evidence comes from? From the Quran. Some verses in the Quran say that Allah created for you, not Muslims, you, humans, everything on earth. One amazing ayah even, it includes heavens. وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مِنْ Allah made for you use, for your benefit, everything in heavens and on earth, all from Him. Why? Because this is organically connected with your job as trustees on earth. If you want to establish righteous life, life, development, happy life, physically even, or materially, okay? To, to reach that, you need to have resources. The resources are around you. But since you are a trustee, if you act in accordance with what God tells you, then you're a good trustee, otherwise you're betraying that trust. It is that argument that was based on another recent talk I gave in, in, in London about uh, environmental protection and sustainability from an Islamic perspective. And I made the same argument. If a human is a trustee of these resources, it means the abuse of these resources, the pollution of air, water, all poisonous things that are, we are doing as humans is a betrayal of trust. So from the ethical standpoint, the environmental protection and sustainability is part of the sacred uh, function of being uh, trustee of Allah. In the, in the last part, I'd like to take some liberty also to articulate why, at least in one of my humble mind, that recognition of human dignity, respect of human dignity as a universal thing for all human beings, regardless their obedience or belief or whatever, they are still entitled to be treated as human beings, that this could act as what I call the core or anchor of many other things that I'm going to tell in brief. One, freedom of faith and worship. And the Quran is crystal clear that let there be no coercion in the matter of faith. In fact, in Surah Al-Kahf, literally the name of Surah the Cave, speak about the seven sleepers as most known in Western literature. It says, this is the truth from your Lord. Whoever with a will accepted, let him or her accept. And whoever with a will choose to reject it, let him reject it. But of course, it makes the warning to reject the message of God has consequences. But we don't punish you here. It's not up to us to judge you. It's up to God in the day of judgment. But so long as you're living here on earth, you're dwelling on earth, nobody should force you. And the strange thing about this ayah is that, like I said, the exact expression is used in parallel. Whoever wills, let him be. Exact expression that means God Himself granted the human being the right, if He chooses, knowing the consequences to be a believer or to reject him. So who is anyone to say, you know, you believe or else? This is not the only one. There are numerous ayat in the Quran along the same line of freedom of faith. Another aspect that relates to faith also of anyone is freedom of worship. And the argument here, what does recognition that you have the right to believe in what you want to believe, but no right to practice. SubhanAllah, doesn't make any sense. So freedom of worship is akin uh, uh, of, to freedom of uh, faith. In fact, there is a reference to the Quran uh, in Surah 22, Al-Hajj, the name of the Surah, uh, that alludes 
to the responsibility of all to protect all places of worship, not mosques only, all places of worship. And that becomes a great responsibility if Muslims, true Muslims, are in power. Let me read it for you because it's a crucial one and somebody may say, how come? How come? Even the places of worship that they utter things that Muslims consider associating others with God or whatever. Yes. وَلَوْلَا لَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ لَهُ الدِّمَةَ صَوَامِعُ وَبِيعُ وَصَلَوَاتُ وَمَسَاجِدُ يُذْكَرُ فِيهَا سُمْ اللَّهِ كَفِيرٌ The most sensible interpretation of this, if I will give a clear translation, it says, how it had, has it been, or had it been, that God stops, meaning the aggression, of one group of people by others, the countervailing powers, the, the check on absolute power, that means there is tyranny. The first thing it says that this tyranny would make people unhappy, would, would promote it, just no. It refers to places of worship because that is the worst persecution to destroy the places of worship that people derive their spirituality from it, whether you agree with, with it or not. Let's say it, then many places of worship would be damned, demolished, and it includes, guess what? Uh, churches, monasteries, synagogues, and mosques. I know some people interpret it differently, but to me, it is obvious that you can't do that. You can't destroy places of worship. So respect of belief is respect of expression of belief, and the places also of other communities uh, of belief. And by the way, if you compare, for example, when, when Umar, the second caliph, Islam entered into Jerusalem victoriously, there was no bloodshed really. And actually the, the, uh, the patriarch of Christians insisted that he would give the key to the church to no less than Omar. He did not demolish it. In fact, it is said that uh, some people came to Omar or maybe another narration that the time of prayer, Muslim prayer, you know, Muslim pray five times a day, so they were inside that huge church. So the, uh, they said, the patriarch even said, if you want to pray, they, they said, we want to go out. He said, why? To make our prayer. He said, you're welcome to pray here in the church. He politely declined, not because this is not fit. You know what the reason that he gave? He said, because I'm afraid if I, as the commander of believer, it was the Khalifa, Khalifa of all Muslims all over the world at that time, the head, if I pray here, I am afraid that some people after me will come and take it away from you because they say, Omar prayed. SubhanAllah. He talked about the invasions of Muslims past or medieval time, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and the destruction uh, and other places also when you had occupying power. Destruction of, of the, the mosques was number one uh, on agenda. So that's another application of the protection of faith, you might say. Furthermore, it promotes also dialogue, interfaith dialogue. There are two key references to that in the Quran. One is in chapter 3, in verse, I think it's uh, 40, uh, yeah, 64, 3, 40, 64. Uh, very beautiful. I give just the translation because of time. Say, you say, O Muhammad, all people of the book, the word people of the book particularly refers to Jews and Christians because they believe in what they understand as a holy book, at least in its origin, uh, as part of the foundation of faith. Say, all people of the book, mean Jew and Christian in particular, come to a common terms between you and us that we worship none but Allah, the one true God, and that none of us will take the others as patrons instead of God. If they turn away, didn't say kill them, harass them, impose fines on them. 
it says, فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَقُولُوا شَهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ If they turn away, reject this very courteous approach of dialogue. Meaning, give them every basis. Say to them, bear witness that we are Muslims. Not taking any action against them. Another beautiful uh, reference is in Surah 29, Al-Ankabut, in verse 46. SubhanAllah. It teaches Muslims also not only to engage in courteous dialogue with people of the book, but it, it even gets far, far enough even to refer to the common ground between this religion. It doesn't exclude others. I talked about that before, but because of the closeness of these two communities to Muslims, theologically speaking, uh, sometimes not on, on, the, on the ground, but theologically speaking, they have that. It says, do not dialogue with the people of the book except in the best possible way, I mean, which includes courtesy, good reasoning, respect, except for those of them who commit aggression against you. And say to them, we believe in what has been to you, meaning whatever scripture remained intact or part of it, there are, depending on your study of the scriptures and their preservation, uh, what has been revealed to you and what has been revealed to us, meaning the Quran, to us as Muslims, your God and ours is one. We talked earlier about even significant theological differences between a lot of Christians about Jesus being God in human form and the Quran presented him as a great prophet. Okay? How come the Quran says your God and ours is one? Simply because, as any Christian understands, and I feel to Muslims, when you engage in dialogue, try to study what they say, but don't create or bear false witness to make a point and argument. Be truthful about it. In spite of those differences that the Quran refers to, he says, your God and ours is one. Why? Because at least the great majority of Christians, as many those who deviated from that were regarded by Christians as heretics even, is that God is one, that is the argument. God is one, but he manifested himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, or Son. We could use that term. So even that, that thread of monotheism, you might say, why the Quran doesn't agree with the notion of Trinity? The same Quran also says, at least we have common belief in God. How, how do we understand it? That's not a very The Quran indicates quite clearly that the Quran, and historically, by the way, this is absolutely true, the Quran was preserved intact without the slightest change. There are detailed aspects about that that some people need to be aware of. Anyway, that's a whole subject uh, in itself. But the Quran, in fact, is the last revelation, and Muslims take that as the criterion. Criterion, which is the name, one of the names of the Al Furqan that we were reciting, our brother were reciting. Al Furqan is one of the names of the Quran. And Furqan means something that divides between what was original liberation versus people's addition or interpretation, between what is right or wrong, based on, of course, Muslim belief without forcing it on others. So this ayah is amazing in the way even it says alright we have line of commonality here in terms of scriptures, revelation, and belief in in the one God. Yeah. One more thing before I leave that <coughs> issue of uh, respecting of faith as part of human dignity is that in Islamic law religious minorities living under Muslim rule are entitled to have their own personal law. The word personal law, like in the West, sometimes they as family law. The issues of marriage, divorce, custody of the children, division of property, inheritance, you know, we call it, these are all issues for, for a practicing Jew or Christian or other faith. It's not just a matter of law or, you know, it's a matter of deep religious 
connection. So that again is a, a right that is seldom given to Muslims. In India, perhaps because of the legacy of British occupations and huge uh, presence of Muslims in a powerful position in India, that they, they have their personal law, even though some people now, some extremists are calling for canceling that. But in Islam, historically, until today, like that, for example, in Egypt, this is called Mahakam al Millia, religious uh, courts. For example, in Canada and the United States, if you want to get married, you marry according to what? Essentially, the law. You can't get a marriage officer uh, from Christianity or rabbi or Muslim imam. I happen to have a certification to officiate uh, the marriage, marriage contract. I don't charge anything anyway, so my love was all good. <laughs> anyway, I've been doing that since 1970. When, uh, 72 when I got the certification. Anyway, um, but actually your marriage would not be valid unless you get either a qualified marriage officer or the signature of a justice of peace. Otherwise, it's not for your marriage. But even clergy have no right to divorce you. They may make sure that if you're divorcing, you meet the religious requirement, but their divorce cannot be official. You have to go through the courts of law, regardless. In the case, for example, in Egypt, Christians are a minority. That's debated whether it's 5%, maybe 10% would be closer. Some people exaggerate for obvious reasons. Anyway, but minority, minority, small minority. Until this day, they can go to their own priest to get uh, for example, divorce, and that becomes valid. Even the 90% of the Muslims are, are under different kind of problem. There is no more tolerance in it. Uh, we cannot do that also for criminal law and civil contracts, but at least there is recognition. And I consider it part of respect of the right of faith of people. Secondly, the right of life, not the life of Muslim only, the right of any innocent person, a human being. In fact, in the Quran, equates killing one person, one person, unfairly, without due justification, is like killing the whole of humanity. And saving a single life is like saving the life of all uh, humanity. You can refer to chapter 5, verse 32. Chapter 17, also verse 33, it's, the principle is very well established. But again, in Islamic jurisprudence, the protection of life is not only to keep the person alive, you know, or to say, oh, uh, I protect your life that in the negative sense, nobody has a right to take your life. But it doesn't mean much. Protection of life includes as classical jurists indicated uh, that your right for food, for clothing, for shelter, if you are a person who is a, a, a trades person and you don't have money, the state should give you money or lend you money to buy the equipment or tools through which you can uh, earn, earn money. So it includes all of your needs, including, of course, also uh, health care as well. Um, a third, and I'm getting close when I reach five, a third teaching is to protect and respect the mind. But I think a better translation of jurist uh, translation of aql, from aql is from aql, I understand, uh, is reason, respect for reason. And the Quran is full of verses don't they uh, see? Meaning, use your faculty, hear, think, contemplate. Even in reading the Quran, it says, don't they reflect deeply on the Quran? Uh, or are there locks over their hearts? Like, have a lock on your heart? So the use of knowledge, in fact, 
I argued in my paper about Muslim contribution to civilization, that these numerous verses inspired people who did not have much civilization, the Arabs before Islam, up to the seventh century when Islam came. It was one of the impetus that uh, urged Muslims as part of the worship, broader worship of God, to reflect and discover what Allah uh, created in, in the universe. So reason is there. But reason is not necessarily seen as the uh, counterpart of, intellig of the uh, intelligence. So if anything your mind cannot fully comprehend, then reason should be the superior thing, the final decider. And that's false, even in terms of the, uh, the, the notion or theory of knowledge, the assumption of many people that knowledge is only what you can empirically prove in the laboratory, or prove at least by logic, logic, uh, reasoning, deduction, induction, but there is nothing beyond that. That is challenged in the Quran, challenged also by people of faith, at least that I know of, uh, a little more about uh, Christians and Jews, and I believe there may be some parallel also in other religions, that there are things that are not necessarily contra reason or rationality, but supra reason, beyond reason. Anyone who believes in God, you can make all kinds of arguments, you cannot prove it to the skeptic. But you ask your heart, contemplate whatever little evidence that you can see in the creation of this universe. But if you tell me you have to bring God in a just tube to believe that God is there, it's, it's false in itself because it's arbitrary, limit the sources of knowledge where hundreds of millions of people with high intelligence in various areas, places, religion, many actually could not really comprehend how God is not limited by time or space. It is beyond us. So it's not superstition. It's not contrary. It is beyond the limit of human intelligence and reason. It is part of that reason why the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, prohibit, I'm not, I might be in trouble here in PC, prohibit any narcotic that declouds the mind. Because some people think that the word ham in the Quran means wine. No, the, literally in Arabic, ham, anything that declouds the mind. Of course, we have no right to impose uh, on others. Uh, we, we can't just go around with sticks in our hand. Thou shalt not have any cannabis or marijuana or whatever. But for those who believe in the word of God and his wisdom, obey him, that's part that is connected also, not just because it's good, not bad, because it causes accident, all of this. No. It beclouds that beautiful gift of God. And when that is being clouded, you know sometimes the moral sense of some people that is weakened or numbed. And crimes are committed in that, rapes are being committed sometimes under this. But in any case, I'm just referring to what appeared to be a specific teaching, but it's related also to the all all over all philosophy of life. Protection of the family that as a cornerstone of society. Say, are you including people who have different beliefs about so-called new mother types of families? Anything goes? No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying for a Muslim, for a Muslim who believes in this, family is the cornerstone of society. And when you say this family has to be protected, whatever you believe in what family is to you, you have no right to object also. The, the, you give you your right to have modern source of our belief in a different side of family. You have no right to force those who are traditionalists, they want call them what you want. That both parties to manage should have protection, children should be protected, uh, children should get good teaching of what is harmful to them and what is good for them. There is no harm 
raising them morally until they become adult enough and you know, they learn for themselves. So this is also another one. And finally, protection of property. That the right to own and dispose of property as you wish, uh, except for the duties that you have to pay on this beauty. Religiously, a Muslim pay zakah, which is a pillar of Islam, and at the same time, one of the most effective means, past and present, if people do that, of promoting social justice and narrowing the gap between uh, rich uh, and, and poor. Uh, and in case of secular society, also obvious, you have to pay the taxes anyway. So other than that, you can dispose of your property, no cheating, no deception. So it's our own. And guess what, before I say that to you, big word. You know those paradigms and various forms of freedom that I spoke about are called maqasid al-sharia, the supreme objective of sharia. I waited until that point because if I say sharia, in the beginning, somebody will say sharia, cutting hands and chopping heads. <laughs> which is a very, very twisted understanding. It says that Sharia, in the sense that I described, these are the maqasim, this is the essence of Sharia. Sharia is not a law. Sharia is not even Islamic law. You might say Sharia based Islamic law, and those could change in particular as involve interpretation by humans. But this, however, you cannot say, I can cancel protection of life. Uh, because I'm, I'm modernizing. No, these are permanent things. And the Quran says, in Surah Shara, Allah made Shara from Sharia. Uh, that which He taught to uh, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, and of course the Prophet was included in that, the five greatest prophets. So Sharia actually is the essence of that justice and care and protection of dignity of the human in its various facets. No wonder we find some classical scholars when they speak about Sharia. Say Sharia is all goodness, is all justice, is all mercy. And anyone who makes an argument that does not meet those requirements is not talking about the Sharia of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, there are those. Otherwise, you, know, you can't have a society without regulation. But Sharia is beyond that. These are the permanent foundation. So, subhanAllah, the, the, the concept itself has been put upside down in the minds of many people. To conclude, I have suggested humbly before you that it is very important in our world today to reach out to every human being irrespective of convictions. The Quran establishes Plurality that as a fact of life, as a fact of life, plurality, even, even religious plurality. In the Quran, it says, if, if God willed, he would have made all of you one people. No races, no color, and maybe unisex so that we don't keep, keep getting at each other's throat between men and women. Okay, Allah could have made that. But uh, an amazing ayah also. And I think it's Surah 2, it's Surah 10 in Ayah 99. وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَأَمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِعًا If Allah will, God will, He will have made all people on earth believers, i.e. in the right theology, in the correct oneness of God. So if this is the will of Allah, so who is anyone or any force or power to say no? My religion is the ultimate of goodness and salvation and this and that, and thou shalt convert or else. That's the only thing. You can communicate, you can do dialogue, but you have no right to force anyone one way or the other. And finally, I prove all of that with one often neglected and forgotten ayah in the Quran, especially by people on the extreme. And deviant interpretations. That appeared in Surah 60 in Mutahana, 
verse 7 and 8, but I just give the translation of one, because one will give you the meaning. This is not my word, it's not my philosophy, it is the word of Allah to me as a Muslim, as it is to all Muslims. Forgive me the last quotation in the origin. لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروكم وتقصتوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقصد Allah just a simple concept Allah does not forbid you Muslims and this is Muslim all Muslims with respect to those meaning people other human beings who one did not fight you because of your religion. That's the so-called religious war which has no concept in the Quran at all. Holy war is a myth. It's a, it's a contradiction. War can never be holy. Anyway, Allah does not forgive you with respect to the One, they abstain from killing you as a Muslim. And I don't think anyone, no matter how you explain that crusade, or the massacres in Srebrenica of seven to 10,000 men and boys by people who falsely carry the, uh, the cross and think that they're doing that for the sake of Christ, like the crusade. This has nothing to do with the noble teaching of Isa Islam. This is the kind of exception that you can't stand still for someone and say, no, no, peace, peace, brother, peace, brother, until all peaceful people are finished. وَلَمْ يُخْرِجُكُمْ مِنْ دَيْهِ Did not drive you out of your homes. Because this is the worst of oppression as it's happening, let me say openly, that what's happening to Palestinian people that led many good-hearted Jewish people, Jewish organizations like Independent Jewish Voices to protest in no uncertain terms about the way the Palestinian people are treated by Zionists, and Zionists is not just a religion, it's a political ideology. And, and other Christians as well, even who are boycotting uh, products from land that is confiscated uh, from Palestinians. So there's no question, Palestinians or others, the, the men, people in Myanmar and others. So these are conditions that are really very important ones, nobody can debate really that anyone should accept that without resistance, but resistance in the proper way and protect, proper uh, protocol. If they abstain from that, and that applies to them, what are they entitled here to, according to that verse, that you should treat them in bir. I deliberately use the Arabic term bir because many translators say in kindness, but the word bir is more than kindness because it is the same word that one, that the Quran and Hadith use to refer to a Muslim obligation toward his or her, yes, parents. So it's not only kindness, but respect. You don't have to, I mean, even if those parents are not Muslim, you have to respect them, treat them more than kindly. Okay? What to treat them with justice. This is what the Quran teaches. War would be only allowed under one of these two. And this is confirmed in so many places in the Quran. You're not allowed to fight someone because his religion is different, because that's his right, whether you agree with it or not. In Surah Al-Baqarah, it says, fight in the way of God. Those who fight against you, so who initiated aggression, or oppression, fight in the way of God, those who fight against you, which means if they don't fight, you don't fight them. Okay? وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا But don't commit adwan, adwan literally means excesses. Yeah, what we call today in international law, proportionality in response to aggression. Not to say I will have to bring them to their knees and bury them all alive. As much as little force as needed to stop that aggression or oppression. Because it says Allah doesn't love those who commit aggression, 
in integration in either meaning. This is basically the message that I believe that in spite of all the sins of Muslims, despite of the atrocities, condemnable atrocities made by some of them under the banner of Islam or in any other excuse, nationalistic or otherwise, that this has nothing to do with that message. And I believe if that message is first understood, internalized, and applied by Muslims to give a shining example, but if they don't, as the Quran world, if you turn away from the message of Muslims, Allah will bring other people who will do the will of Allah. And in fact, Allah doesn't have need for Muslims or others. We need to follow his path. And maybe perchance someone who's not a Muslim at least might agree with this much common ground. So we work together towards a better world of prosperity, justice, and peace. Thank you very much for the good news. So God gave you the power of sight, hearing, and afida. So afida, actually, some people they talk about the heart, but others actually say the heart is used in the Quran symbolically to refer to intellect. For example, let me quote you one ayah direct from the Quran. فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارَ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي بِالصُّدُورِ He's speaking about people who are closing their minds to thinking and understanding. So it says it is not the eyes physically that get blind, but what get blind are the hearts which are in your cavities, you might say. You see what I mean? So his heart, obviously, uh, is, is not the physical four rooms <laughs> you know, uh, organ in, in the body. So it, the heart here is referred to actually in the sense of yama, the blind thing. The, the, the spiritual nature of the person is such that they reject that or they do not have any pressing need for spirituality in their lives. for the lecture, I find it really beneficial. Uh, you mentioned a couple of verses in the Quran about religious tolerance. So in Surah Baqarah, there is no coercion in religion. And in Surah Kiyat, whoever wants, to, whoever wants to believe, let them believe. And whoever wants to disbelieve, let them disbelieve. And you also mentioned the ayah in Surah Mumtahina. Now you might have already answered this, but in the Quran when it says, fight those who disbelieve, is that applicable to us nowadays, or is it only applicable in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? There is no ayah in the Quran if it's understood in its proper context and the context of all the things that we spoke about that says five non-believers simply because they are non-believers, none whatsoever, unless there is you know, some problem with interpretation. The ayat in the Quran is valid for all times, actually, if the conditions are there. 
And if you look at those area, five, lack of five, it speaks also about their aggression against you, the betrayal of their treaty with the Prophet. But there is nothing as a blank fighting because of it. But that is contradict all of this idea. So one has to put it really in context. That fight those aggressors, as if it's saying, fight those aggressors who happen to be rejectors. And that makes sense because why are they fighting you? Why were the uh, people of Quraysh fighting the Prophet and uh, torturing some of his followers to death, like the family of Ammar ibn Yasser? And as you know, more than one the story about an attempt on his life. The most famous one, of course, is the one that preceded his migration from uh, Mecca to Medina. So people have committed those atrocities and happened to be kuffar, but not, not the Taymiyyah. It's just to show that it's even very well-respected classical scholars uh, address that issue. But even though it's not a big deal because the Quran is clear, all the ayat I mentioned are very clear on that. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, as Shaykh of Islam, because of his influence, and open-mindedness also, he discusses that issue. Are Muslims fighting people who are non-believers in Islam because they're non-believers or because of their aggression? And he concluded, which is natural to me, and it was a big surprise, no, fighting them because of their aggression, but it happened that these were kuffar and Jews. Not now. But not every kafir or one who doesn't accept Islam is fighting Muslim. Or else, what is the meaning of the ayah I, I quoted in the conclusion that those who are not fighting you because of your religion or driving you out of your homes, obviously it's not, it's not speaking about Muslims, it's speaking about kuffar, but they are rejected Islam, which is that typical meaning of kuffar covering up, they don't want to accept Islam, which is the right, the responsibilities with Allah. Uh, so it's not their, their religion, it is whether they abstain, in which case you be good to your neighbor. And the, in course in the Quran and Hadith, there are texts of being kind to your neighbor, who is a Muslim, not a Muslim, not your relative. When Jari, the Torah, when Jari, Junum, even a casual traveler sitting by you, without knowing anything of it, he's entitled to kind of treatment. So the context is very important. I'm glad that you raised that. If any of you is interested, I have a little paper also that was presented in the uh, European Council of Fatwa and Research. It's called Muslim and Non-Muslim Relation, where uh, the most important frequently quoted, misquoted, or quoted and misunderstood uh, ayat al Quran <coughs> about fighting. Uh, if uh, you don't find it online, because some of these things, I don't know if some people put it for me on, online, but if you search under Muslim and, I think it's in Google, in Google Muslim and non-Muslim relations. <coughs> if you don't find it, you can, you're welcome to email me to the uh, MSA here, and I'd be glad to send you an electronic copy. It deals with the subject and explain also in the beginning the methodology of the proper interpretation of that. That was the, my favorite topic when I was teaching the uh, introduction to the Quran at Sudbury. It's a very, very fascinating one how to interpret and avoid, properly interpret and avoid uh, pitfalls in Dr. Badawi, uh, thank you for your talk today. Um, the title of the talk, A World Without Islam, is also the title of a book, A World Without Islam. And uh, are you familiar with the book? Um, well, in, in, I guess what I've heard from you this evening is a world without Muslims and that it would be a very different world. Um, so maybe that's a comment, not a question. We can take extreme approach one way or the other. Uh, from the very beginning and toward the end, I alluded also to the notion that Islam is not Muslim. 
and Islam is not the action of some people. Because that is the equivalent to the fallacy of saying Christianity is the crusade or Vietnam War or injustice uh, in some countries, social injustice or racism or whatever. Uh, Islam, to me, based on the etymology and the descriptive nature of what the two main sources of Islam, the Quran and Hadith, elaborate. It is the idea. Because it is, this is not partisan. Because most of believe this is the guidance of Allah. And you might have heard me, and may, most of you perhaps might have taken notes even of how many verses I refer to, or hadith. There's lots of documentation for that. So once you get the proper hermeneutics or the proper method of interpretation, and once there is also a good reason to believe that this is definitive, not a change of a thing, like oneness of God, justice, mercy, also are issues. Once you know that, this becomes the criterion to define Islam, but Muslims do not define Islam. Muslims <coughs> are human beings. In one case, I, mean, I haven't read that book, but to be honest with you, I'd be interested in that. Uh, and I don't know whether that was, uh, has prompted you to do that, or is it incidental? Yeah? Incidental. Incidental. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Muslims are human beings. And there are variety of degrees of commitment as it is in any community of faith. So neither can we say that there were any religion, or not religion, any followers of any religion, cannot be demeaned or demonized, that they're all nothing but devils. Uh, if Islam, for example, is 1,500 years old, you just hand pick <coughs> deviation special uh, serious deviations. You look today, I mean, yes, there are uh, severe deviations. I will have to elaborate on that. I alluded to that in the Friday sermon. Uh, today, it's a continuous process, and sometimes, like I say, people knowingly or honestly mistakenly attribute it to Islam, which is, has nothing to do whatsoever with Islam. Uh, so that degrees, there is no time where any followers were pure angels or pure devils. But the issue here is that if you take collectivity, not, not selectively in one particular period of decline and ignorance or misbehavior, if you take a history of any civilization, for example, 1400 years in the case of Islam, others might have a longer period. It's a, it's, a compar it's a relative comparison. How much justice was done? There may be some injustice, is that no question. But how much injustice compared to past history or even later history when they were in, in power? I'll just give you one example. I don't think I'm partisan on this. You hear today about the problems in, in governments of budget deficit. Seldom you hear about budget, you know, uh, so forth. Uh, excess. At the time of Amr ibn Abdul Aziz, hardly the, about the turn of the first Hijri century, so very close, very, to the, uh, the uh, end of the mission of the Prophet, end, end of him. But that, the mission itself continues. Anyway. That his, uh, his governor in North Africa wrote to him, and he said he collected the amount of zakat. He said zakat is compulsory, so it has a minimum, a certain minimum, so on. He said we collected zakat and also sadaqat, voluntary, additional, and we went around that every poor was given enough. And we have excess fund. It's like a president going to, uh, to legislation and say, we have problems. We have taken all of, all of the poor and needy. We have a very comprehensive health system. 
No pre-existing conditions are required. Everybody is living prosperity. We have difficulty. We have a few trillion dollars that we don't know what to do with. Anyway, it's a possibility that shows indeed in reality. That's just, this is not a, this is a factual issue. It's not a letter. And you know, the Omar of Abdul Aziz, because he was a very just person after some deviation in the you know, Muawiyah, Mayyad, some of the higher products, he wrote to him and he said, Well, if, if you're sure that no poor is in need of anything, use that money and buy people who are in bondage, slaves, and free them. Find a good cause to spend that money. So it, we're not talking this. Uh, I, I remember one of the Western authors, the name escapes me now, he said, the, the, the world has never known but to use the term that I don't agree with, but to, and for honesty's sake, I say, Fatihan. Uh, Fatihan means literal opener, but sometimes take it, take it as conqueror, who were more merciful and more just than, he used the term Arabs, but he meant, of course, Muslims for, for that man. I can give you tons of information about that. It doesn't mean that some orders were unjust, but when they were unjust, they were unjust not only to non-Muslim, to Muslim even, uh, them, themselves. So comparative, uh, the uh, prosperity and reasonable peace. You find here some fights here and there, but you don't get massive things like the Crusades, for example, happening in the history of Islam. You don't get massive massacres of innocent people uh, as it happened in the, the Crusaders going to Jerusalem. The opposite. When Muslims were victors, and the very famous noble um, leader, Salahuddin, in English, Saladin, entered, you could have done the same uh, bloodletting. He said that those Christians who came from Europe first who want to go, we guarantee their security if they want to leave until the present the end of our authority. You go in peace. You never destroyed uh, a cross, or dis demolished a church, or anything of that nature. And those who stay, there is no nothing that resembles any form of massacres has happened just 19 years, almost 99 years or less, less than a century before that. So when we compare, perhaps, yes, we should be aware of faults. And we don't stop at faults. Yes, but we should also balance that by looking at a period of prosperity and justice and conclude everyone according to their own scholarship and information, hopefully less bias but more objectivity. You can say one civilization was distinct by this kind of behavior and I like to compare to it. But again, no angels, no devils <coughs> in the absolute sense. I think um, in the interest of time, I think we may have to uh, uh, wrap up here. I know, uh, my apologies, I know there's a, there's a lot of hands going up. I, I do uh, understand that Dr. Jamal, but we will be around, inshallah, for a little bit longer. Uh, so feel free, if, uh, if, you, if you didn't get your chance to have your question answered, feel free, if that's okay with you, just to engage with you. can come down. Yeah. Uh, my apologies again, just in the interest of time, and also just a heads up uh, for anyone that did join us, maybe late. Uh, thank you for coming. I know, uh, you know, with traffic, with finding parking on campus, finding this building. I know it's hard, sometimes hard to get to, but thank you all for coming. Um, it, it was truly a wonder, uh, wonderful experience on behalf of the organizations, MSA, MAC, and, and all of you. Um, if you didn't get a chance to register, uh, please do so. Um, the, the gentleman is standing up right now, uh, Austin. Uh, he has a laptop, he's registering, and what that does is once you do uh, provide your email address, that's okay with you. Um, you, well, we're going to send out links for the full record, recording. As you see, we have some cameras going on here. Uh, so we'd like to send the recording over to you so you can catch up on anything that you missed or if you wanted to revisit um, any of the lecture content, it, we want to make that available for you. But again, thank you so much. You guys have been uh, wonderful. But it's up here and thank you, uh, Dr. Badoui, for joining us here for this. Um, I, know it, I know it's been a long
long nights, a long day, probably jet lag. Uh, but you know, uh, when, when I look at you, it's truly inspiring to see someone who's a trooper, someone who's uh, here to give it their all, and uh, doesn't make excuses. Um, so thank you, and just a, uh, a small token of our appreciation, uh, just a small gift uh, for you. Uh, thank you very much, and we hope that you don't come in 10 years like you did last time. <laughs>